Hey you, stay away from places like this. I was told this by Nick, a supervisor from the same company. Just the other day, I had taken a paid leave for today, and he had already made a snide remark about it, yet here we were. Running into each other unexpectedly. The man standing next to him looked like he couldn't possibly lead a decent life. I wanted to run away. In desperation, I maintained minimal defense, but this only ended up infuriating the man even more. Behind me was my wife, looking anxious. We found ourselves in a dire predicament, but the situation took a drastic turn with the appearance of a certain woman. Later on, this incident would profoundly change the lives of Nick and the Mafia man. My name is Kevin. I am 38 years old, a regular office worker in a small to medium-sized company, and I hold the position of section head. I have a wife who is three years younger than me, but we don't have children. Right after we got married, my wife was diagnosed with a disease that led to the complete removal of her uterus. This meant that it was no longer possible for us to have children. I thought living just the two of us wasn't too bad, but after the surgery, my wife was quite distressed and often threatened to divorce, blaming herself for ruining my life. Honestly, those days were like living through hell. But by facing my wife head-on and having numerous discussions, we managed to find peace. Even without children, going on trips together or enjoying slightly expensive dinners made me feel completely happy. Gradually, my wife started to recover, and around the time I was promoted to section head, an incident occurred. Just before this incident, the previous department head had retired. Sitting in that empty department head's seat was Nick. In his mid-40s, he was selected to be the department head, but Nick was the nephew of the CEO, Mr. Yale, who had joined the company through connections. Nick, who believed strongly in educational elitism, refused to entrust important tasks to employees with only high school diplomas, delegating only basic tasks to those with college degrees. Naturally, the less educated employees were angry at this unfair assignment of work, while the college graduates complained about the abnormal increase in their workload. Yet all Nick did was shout, if you have a problem with my methods, leave right now. Remember, I am the nephew of Mr. Yale and he showed no signs of listening. Since then, Nick began to decide everything based on educational attainment. When a high school graduate tried to attend an important meeting with a client, Nick would say, you're pointless. A high school grad shouldn't be sticking their nose into this and arbitrarily make changes. Or when a college graduate helped a high school graduate employee, he would say, don't pamper them. You are a college grad. You shouldn't need to help such people. Thanks to Nick's arrival, our department became chaotic, and now someone quits almost every month, leading to an abnormal situation. The reason Nick can continue to be arrogant is that our office is a branch, not the main headquarters. Mr. Yale, his uncle, is based at the headquarters and seems to be abroad often, focusing on globalization efforts. Furthermore, our branch manager, Mr. Harvey is conservative. At first, everyone complained to Mr. Harvey, but now no one does anymore. Mr. Harvey would say, endure it, he's the nephew of Mr. Yale, and wouldn't deal with our complaints at all. That's why, unwillingly, we had to accept Nick's tyranny, and our workplace became a place where hard-working people suffer. Thus, those who work earnestly are the quickest to leave. While we do recruit new employees, the people who could train them have left, so no one can teach them. Even if someone could teach, Nick would say, don't learn from anyone but a college graduate and appoint some college-educated employee as the trainer. Consequently, college graduates not only have a heavier workload but now also have to train new hires, leading some to mistreat the newcomers. This means that the new hires don't develop well, and within two or three months, they leave, worsening the atmosphere further. Employees who can't leave are mostly those with families. They need money for their children's education, their wives are expecting, or they are paying for their parents' care in nursing homes. Everyone has such circumstances, and quitting at such a time would put their families in trouble. Nick knows this and seems to exploit it. If something happens, he would tell the male employees, if you run away, your wife and kids will suffer, won't they? And to the female employees. In this day and age, no one would hire a woman with kids like you if you leave such a good company. Everyone is looking for a job change, but it's hard to find a good place and knowing that others will suffer if they leave makes it difficult for them to actually quit. I am one of those people. Recently, my wife and I have been planning something, so I cannot afford to be unemployed. Additionally, 
our income greatly affects our plans. Therefore, I absolutely have to find a company that offers better conditions and is okay in terms of salary. It's hard to find such a company, and my job hunting efforts aren't going well. This method of Nick's, taking employees' families hostage, puts everyone under immense stress. Gradually, the branch's performance started to decline. Annoyed Mr. Harvey forced us into unreasonable overtime and mandated work on holidays, creating a chaotic situation. I was living amidst this uncertainty. Perhaps due to such a lifestyle, my spirit was considerably drained. But then, unexpectedly, I received a call from someone. It was from my mother, who lives far away with my sister. Mike's third death anniversary is coming up, so come back home. And isn't Kate's birthday soon? She's always been so focused on the house and hasn't married, always staying single, let's at least celebrate with just us. Though I had planned to return for my father's third death anniversary, it was surprising that my mother wanted to celebrate Kate's birthday. In our family, the women are quite strong, and usually, my sister and my mother have been at the forefront of everything. I remember my father saying with a laugh that I couldn't hold a candle to the way my mother and my sister efficiently managed the house. Of course, my wife was invited too, and when I checked with her, she was happy about it. So, I replied okay to my mother and had already submitted a leave application at work. As expected, Nick sneered, taking leave at such a busy time, huh? Well, there's limited stuff a high school grad like you can do anyway. Do as you like. At least, we had planned to take leave on Friday, fly back with my wife, and meet my mother at a restaurant she had chosen on Saturday night. Then, the day arrived. The traffic's bad, and the taxi isn't moving much. Sorry, but could you start without me? Having just received this message from my mother, my wife and I decided to go ahead into the restaurant. We had reserved a private room in the back, but had to pass the counter seats to get there. As we were being led by the staff, a voice called out from the side. Hey, isn't that you, Kevin? Wondered what you'd do taking leave. A date with your wife in the distant suburbs? I don't mind. But it's a shame the burden falls on other employees. Actually, what's a guy like you doing in a nice place like this? Turning around, there was Nick, with his usual irritating smirk. I had heard from a colleague that Nick was also going back home or something, and he had dumped his work on others before leaving on Friday. Beside him sat a burly man who clearly didn't seem like a decent person. He scrutinized me from head to toe as if sizing me up. Feeling uncomfortable, I tried to pass by with a brief greeting, but Nick grabbed my arm to stop me. Wait a minute. Since we're here, let me introduce you to this guy. This is my friend, Tucker, and this is one of my subordinates, Kevin. Not much to show for himself, and just a bottom feeder with only a high school diploma. Before I could say anything, Nick condescendingly introduced me. As Nick spoke, the mafia-looking man named Tucker said, Oh really? But you dress pretty nice. Looks like you have money, huh? Hey, since it's such a rare occasion, why don't you join us for a drink today? Of course, you're treating, even though you look younger. Well, age aside, you're paying anyway. Feeling a bad premonition, I instinctively protected my wife by standing in front of her. I cannot do that. I have plans to dine with my family today. As I refused, Tucker's face stiffened instantly. His irritation became apparent as he started fidgeting restlessly. Tanner had a look of exasperation, as if saying just go along with it. I had no time to deal with these guys, so I turned on my heel to head to the private room. But an irritated Tucker said, wait, and continued. Don't you see? I'm a mafia, collecting protection money around here. Do you understand what happens if you defy me? Is it okay if something happens to your wife behind you, huh? Tucker's gaze alone was intimidating enough to make one tremble, and for a moment, my legs froze. My wife looked at me with concern and anxiety. I could simply give Tucker and Nick some money to resolve this, for the safety of my wife. But, it didn't feel right to yield to such tactics. I struggled to control a strong impulse and responded firmly, no matter what, I will not comply with your demands. Just as I spoke, Tucker, seemingly reaching his limit, abruptly stood up from his chair. What are you doing? A commanding voice echoed through the small restaurant. Everyone's gaze shifted to the entrance, where a petite woman was standing. Startled, I checked the time, about five minutes had passed since we entered. 
Wearing large sunglasses and sporting nearly blonde long hair, she exuded an impressive aura. For a moment, I thought I saw Tucker's eyes waver. Meanwhile, Nick, unaware of who the woman was, shouted at her, Who are you, lady? Outsiders should keep their mouths shut. Ignoring his words, the woman approached us with the click of her high heels. Then, to me she said, You, if you're even the son of Mike, you need to pull yourself together. I feel embarrassed as your sister. Surprisingly, I was the one being scolded. Scratching my head, I apologized, sorry. Kate. At that, Tucker let out an almost scream-like shout, his sister? To Nick, it must have seemed irrelevant that the sister I was going to have dinner with had appeared. But to Tucker, my sister, Kate, seemed to be someone special. He started trembling as he looked at her. Nick was taken aback and asked him, what's wrong? Ignoring Nick, Tucker greeted her energetically, Kate, it's been a while. Kate slightly shifted her pitch black sunglasses to look at Tucker and burst out laughing, oh, it's you, Tucker. I was wondering who dared mess with my brother and sister, huh? By the end of her sentence, her expression had turned serious. And Tucker seemed only capable of trembling. Nick, still not understanding the situation, looked back and forth between us, but as Tucker desperately told him, Nick, you better apologize. It's for your own good. Nick seemed to grasp what was happening. Nick slowly apologized to her. She, sighing, turned to Tucker and asked. Who taught you to be a nuisance to others? Me? Or mom? Surely not, dad, right? Tucker shook his head as if it might fall off, vigorously denying her words. Nick whispered to Tucker, who is this woman? Eyes wide, Tucker corrected him, how dare you say this woman? She's the underboss of our mafia family. Realizing everything, Nick trembled as he uttered, even a woman, and the underboss of a mafia family. This was a sensitive point for her. At Nick's words, her eyebrows twitched, and her face contorted with displeasure. Though Tucker had been pale with fear before, now his face turned completely white. Indeed, as Tucker said, she is the underboss set to take over the top spot of a mafia family. She is actually feared by the members. Typically, men dominate the top ranks of the mafia, and many might have heard of the term gangster's wife. When our father was the head, our mother was that gangster's wife, but after his sudden death, she temporarily became the acting head. Of course, there were calls for me, the eldest son, to be the next head, but I stepped down. Marrying a civilian wife and not wanting to involve her were my main reasons, but I also believed I lacked the ability to lead a mafia family. Despite some insistence on having a male head, it was Kate who silenced them with her capability. She has always been tough, with a strong sense of justice and a deep love for family. She might have been looked down upon for being a woman, as Nick said. Despite being a woman, but she brushed off those words and secured her position. She had faced many challenges, but they only made her mentally stronger, and she is now eager to relieve our mother of her burdens. Now, no one dares to belittle her as just a woman. Everyone knows she dislikes that term, and all members of our mafia family agree that she is the rightful next boss. Tucker repeatedly begged for forgiveness from her, and Nick, having heard the conversation, realized she was no ordinary woman. For once, Nick's arrogance faded, and he trembled noticeably. Then, in contrast to my formidable sister, a carefree voice sounded. Sorry I'm late, oh, what's this? Needless to say, it was our mother. Tucker, regretting messing with me, looked at me with teary eyes. My mother quickly grasped the situation and turned to Tucker, asking. Aren't you the boy from back then? It seems quite tense here, but can you explain what's happening? Overwhelmed by my mother's commanding aura, Tucker kept apologizing, seeking forgiveness. To a confused Nick, I explained, as you can see, Tucker is a member of the mafia family led by our mother, the current head, and my sister. The next head. Tanner stared at Kate and me, his teeth chattering. With a sigh, Kate suggested, let's not disturb the other customers here. Let's talk in the private room in the back. Tucker, looking utterly deflated, had no choice but to agree. Nick, having relied on Tucker's authority, clearly lacked the courage to challenge someone who even Tucker obediently followed. He replied in a voice as faint as a mosquito's and followed us timidly. We took our seats and ordered drinks. After hearing some of the situation from Kate, our mother spoke to Tucker in a low, grave tone. 
How dare you disgrace our family's name in such a place? The worlds of the straight and the mafia are different. You should know better. The usual swagger drained from Tucker as he faced the stern reproach from our mother, the current head of our family. He was profusely apologetic. Next, my mother turned her attention to Nick, who was frozen in place, not moving an inch. Having no courage to fight against them, Nick looked down, sending me a look as if begging for help. I'm sure Nick also believed that I wouldn't come to his rescue. But he knew all too well that it was only now, after he had repeatedly been sarcastic towards me, that he found it convenient. Indeed, the way Nick looked at me seemed less hopeful and more like a faint glimmer of hope. In the worst case, he might be crushed by our family. If Mr. Yale ever found out about this, Nick could be demoted from his managerial position for colluding with the Mafia. As the saying goes, the eyes are the windows to the soul, Nick spoke volumes with his eyes alone. I sighed softly and spoke to my mother, who looked like she was about to explode in anger. It's partly my fault. I should have stood up for myself instead of backing down. Both Nick and Tucker looked stunned, as if they had never expected me to defend them, their faces showing a glimmer of hope. Kate then said to me, are you showing them mercy? From what I just heard. That person looked down on you just because you only finished high school and practically humiliated you in public. You're still going to forgive him? Nick, at a loss for words, tightly closed his eyes. Tucker started to look visibly nervous. My mother remained silent, observing the situation. I slowly began to speak, sharing my thoughts. I don't like conflicts. You two should know this best. Don't resolve matters by force but by dialogue, wasn't that dad's favorite saying? I may not be as strong as you and the others, but I can engage in dialogue. With that, I straightened my posture and looked Nick in the eye. Nick seemed momentarily confused but then returned my gaze seriously. You were anxious, weren't you? Being the nephew of Mr. Yale, you feared not being taken seriously. And your focus on academic credentials stems from your own struggles to pass entrance exams for a prestigious university. While that's an achievement to be proud of, it doesn't mean that all employees who didn't go to college have given up or dropped out. Isn't society about understanding and respecting each other, helping one another? Nick had nothing to say in response. Instead, Tucker spoke up. I'm sorry. I was just bluffing like Nick. I have a sister suffering from a chronic illness, and Kate helped with the medical expenses. I wasn't aware of that. As I looked towards Kate, she shrugged and said, Tucker's sister is your age. His brother was originally a part of our family and was a great ally of mine. So for Tucker and his sister, they're like family to me. I helped out with the medical costs, with my own money and some from our mother. It's my way of returning the favor since his brother always stood by me, even when I felt isolated. While I was surprised to hear about this connection between her and Tucker, it seemed just like her to go to such lengths. My mother also silently approved of what Kate was doing as the next head of the family. Tucker apologized again for his misconduct. Even though I was unaware, I ended up repaying your kindness with betrayal. You said you would cover the full amount. But I'll work and pay it all back. Before Kate and my mother could respond, I said, there's no need for that. Tucker looked back at me, surprised. I continued to express my thoughts. Indeed, what you did could have tarnished our family's reputation. I live in the civilian world now, detached from the family business. But such actions could inconvenience Kate, my mother, and the members, especially your brother. Pausing for a moment, Tucker seemed to take my words to heart, giving me a serious look. I added. But, you've managed to apologize properly. Normally, one might make excuses to justify their actions. You could easily say that since I'm no longer involved with the family business, it's none of my business. But you didn't resort to such tactics. Instead, you admitted your mistakes openly. I don't think Kate and the others would impose further punishment on someone like that. With that, as if breaking the tension, my mother burst out laughing. I was momentarily flustered, thinking I had said something odd, but then she, no longer as the head of our family but as a mother, said to me, you're becoming more and more like your father. Normally, I would have to condemn Tucker for tarnishing the family's name. But as you said, he's taken responsibility and apologized. This time, I'll forgive him, for your sake. 
I was relieved. Honestly, it was almost a gamble whether my mother would let Tucker off the hook. Since my father's death, she has led with unmistakable authority to ensure she wasn't underestimated. Resolving conflicts within the family with decisiveness. Kate too had made considerable efforts to demonstrate her capabilities, deeply understanding what it means to be part of the Mafia. Whether to forgive Tucker was a delicate matter, but I was relieved that my words had an impact. Tucker, likely never expecting this outcome, teared up and grasped my hand, saying, thank you. For protecting me? Even though I was so rude out of the blue. I slowly shook my head in response to his words. I hadn't really protected Tucker. I had simply stood by my own principles and followed through with them. When I explained this, Tucker, deeply moved, said you are my hero, and showed respect for me, even though I'm younger than him. Feeling a bit odd, I asked him to stop saying that. Please, don't say like that, that's not really my style, I said hesitantly. Perhaps finding it amusing, Kate burst out laughing, dispelling the somber mood. And my mother suggested we toast with some beers that were just brought out. While looking apologetic, Tucker accepted a beer mug. However, Nick, who had been silent until then, politely declined and said, I need to cool off outside. Tucker, stay here. Before he stood up and left the restaurant. I debated whether to follow Nick, but finding no words to comfort him at the moment, I decided to let him be. Ultimately, with one more person, we went ahead and celebrated Kate's birthday as planned, enjoying a delightful meal together. Nick didn't return to the restaurant after that. Having completed my father's memorial service, I returned to the apartment where I live with my wife. When I went to work as usual the following Monday, something felt off. The office, which had been frantic lately, was unusually calm and settled today. I went to my desk and asked a colleague next to me what happened, and apparently, Nick had been transferred or something. And someone who came in temporarily this morning was now in charge. Thanks to him reverting the work assignments Nick had messed up, the daily chaos had settled down. We, the high school graduate employees, had been idle for a while, so we started to regain our motivation. Meanwhile, the college graduate employees finally had some breathing room, and six months after Nick suddenly disappeared. The department had returned to its previous calm state. One day on my way home, I heard children's voices from the park and instinctively looked in that direction. There, in a suit, Nick was sitting on a bench. I hurried over and called out, Nick! He turned around in surprise and smiled weakly. It was a surreal scene, two middle-aged men sitting on a park bench, but I didn't mind and listened to Nick. I've never met someone with a heart as clean as yours, and it made me feel ashamed of myself. Everything you said back then hit the nail on the head. I was panicking, resenting the high school grads for not having it as tough as me, just fueling my own competitiveness. That realization made it impossible for me to go back to the office. He accepted a cup of coffee I bought from a nearby convenience store, and as he thanked me and drank it, Nick's profile looked somewhat lonely. Right after that incident, he confessed everything he had done to his uncle, Mr. Yale, and asked for a disciplinary leave on his own accord. Starting that Monday, Nick had taken voluntary leave and proceeded with his resignation without telling any of us. Apparently, he couldn't face us. He had been job hunting since then but it wasn't going well, realizing how much he had relied on connections for his job. Before joining our company, he had been living as a part-time worker. Having quit a well-known company within a year despite graduating from a prestigious university. Unable to cope with the reality that there were always bigger fish. Worried about such a nephew, Mr. Yale had given him a chance at our company. Lost for words, I hesitated, but then Nick, in contrast to his earlier demeanor, smiled brightly and said. I've realized just how flawed I am. I can't stay here, I've decided to apprentice under the owner of the restaurant where Tucker works. It's a fresh start, but this time I feel like I can pull it through. Surprised by his story. It turned out that Tucker had stopped his half-hearted involvement with the Mafia family and started working as a restaurant chef. That place was a restaurant his sister used to visit when she was healthy. He was determined to make meals for her once she was allowed to leave the hospital or come home temporarily. Of course, Kate hadn't billed him for the medical expenses, but Tucker had decided to save up a significant amount to repay her someday. Inspired by Tucker's actions, Nick decided to join him as an apprentice for his own self-reflection. The restaurant owner was short on hands and grateful for the help, and Nick was set to leave by plane the next day. 
This is probably my last time wearing a suit and walking through the city. I sat here because the sunset looks the most beautiful from this spot. He explained. After listening to him, various words came to mind, but what I needed to say to Nick right then weren't words of consolation or encouragement. Slowly, I raised my head and looked towards Nick, saying, take care. Surprised by my unexpected farewell, Nick briefly showed a stunned expression, but quickly smiled and replied, yeah, I'll be off then. You take care too. Three years passed. I visited my hometown again and knocked on the family home's gate. Instead of the typical scene of underlings lined up, I leisurely walked down the path leading to the house, taking in the view of the garden. Upon seeing us, my mother immediately brightened up with a big smile and exclaimed, Welcome back. Then, without paying much attention to me, she immediately turned to my wife and said, I know it's been tough, but please continue to support him. My wife responded with a smile and handed a precious baby she was carrying to my mother. Carefully cradling her, my mother looked at her peaceful sleeping face and said, Hello there, grandma's here. Yes, we had welcomed a new life into our family. Since my wife doesn't have a uterus, this child isn't our biological offspring. Although the child came to us through special adoption, she's already an important part of our family. We had been planning this special adoption for a long time. The screening was rigorous, and there were many couples waiting for a child, so it took over three years for our turn to come around. But, having finally been able to welcome a child into our family, we brought them to my mother, who had been looking forward to this moment. In fact, the child's birth mother was from this area, which was one of the reasons we moved here after the adoption. It took a while for us to settle down and for me to feel comfortable showing the child to my mother. But she was visibly overjoyed to meet her grandchild. My wife also gazed lovingly at our child. For me, it wasn't important whether the child was born to my wife or not, what mattered was that this child had come into our lives. And I felt it meaningful to raise her as our own. My mother felt the same, and even Kate, who joined us later and is typically known as a formidable figure in the Mafia, wore a gentle smile. Children are remarkable. For the sake of this child's future, I would sever ties completely with my mother and Kate. My wife and I had many doubts about this. After all, it wasn't my idea but one that my mother and others had decided upon. After months of deliberation following the child's arrival, we decided to respect their decision. Thus, today was the first and last day for my mother and others to meet this child. Given the circumstances, we left the child with my mother for a while, and my wife and I went to a restaurant. It was just past the busy lunch hour, so the restaurant was quiet with few other customers. As we entered, we were greeted with a hearty welcome. As we took our seats, a familiar face, now a waiter, brought us a menu and cheerfully said. Long time no see. Today's special is grilled chicken made by Nick. It's really the best. My wife and I burst out laughing, and from the back of the kitchen came Nick's embarrassed shout, Stop it. That's not my special. The restaurant owner joined in the laughter, and I could tell that these three had built a good relationship. Tucker's sister was still hospitalized. But she had recently been granted temporary leave and had come to this restaurant to eat some of Tucker's specials. Tucker's dream had come true, and it seemed he now had a new goal. To open a new restaurant with Nick. How these two became friends was still a mystery, but it was clear they were bound by an invisible, strong bond. After finishing our meal and getting ready to pay, I encouraged them, keep up the good work. Nick who once had a troubled expression and Tucker who used to tremble in fear were no more. Both responded with bright smiles, yes. Life exists as uniquely as there are people, and if one were to look into their histories, they would find a mix of highs and lows. Feeling that I had glimpsed a part of that, I felt strangely moved. I would now build a life with my newly adopted daughter and my family. With that prospect of future joys, my wife and I left the restaurant hand in hand, 